Hi and welcome to our Sabbath School lesson for this week entitled Seeing the Goldsmith's Face. Before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, be with us in our study. Open up our heart, hearts and mind to receive your word today. I pray, Father, Lord, that we may understand that you are a God of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us in our study today. I have been richly blessed by this study because it tugs at, the heart, at our hearts of our life, of what we go through, of trials and tribulations, and how God can use those trials and tribulations and use it to further His glory and to find His face throughout it all. So I want to start off by going to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Before we begin, I want to lay down a few, th a few groundwork of our s to begin our study. We go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and it reads, then God, then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So from the very beginning in Genesis, we're seeing that, we're seeing that God created us, male and female, in his image. In fact, we were created to embody and mirror who God himself and his character what he looks like. So it was his original purpose that when we were created, that he would be able to see himself in us. I think back, I think to my relationship with my son. My son is now two years old, but as a newborn, he was very dark. He's a little much lighter now, but he was very dark and he had a lot of my features. And everyone kept thinking that he looks literally like me. But as he got older, he shed off his dad appearance and he's starting to look like my wife. And so it's kind of like that when you think about created in his image. My son is a splitting image of my wife and me. It's a good mix of both of our features. And so we have the opportunity to see through our kids, through our sons, through our daughters, our image, our personality, our foibles, our, pro our issues, also our good traits into our kids. Now think about that in terms of the Creator creating us. His original purpose was to mold us, to form us, to breathe life by breathing into our nostrils. Imagine that depiction of him getting close to our face, showing that he's very intimate and breathes the breath of life in us. And when we, he did that, we were created and we were formed in his image. That was God's ideal. That was God's, that's what God's purpose was from the very beginning and the inception of time when we were created. So, what is the image that we reflect of him? Well, for one, I could think of right off the bat is that we have a major importance and we really put up in high standards relationships. When you think about it, we thrive, relate, we thrive for relationships. That's why we always search for our soulmates, to look for someone that we could spend for the rest of our lives. We want to be in community of people we love and to spend time with. And that's a splitting image of God himself. God, the triune, triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I heard one preacher says, said that this trinity shows love in perpetual motion. God is revealing his image through us, that we want to have relationship. And that, I think that really shows that we really are God's 
creation. When you look at it, it's actually interesting. I was thinking about how we thrive and we crave relationship. That it's also, it also is shown when you look at prison, there is a thing called solitary confinement where a prison, prison inmate who has done atrocious things, maybe had bad behavior in the ward or wherever in their, commu in their, com in their place where they commune, they would send them to a place called solitary confinement. And this is what the United Nations says. United Nations has deemed solitary confinement for 22 to 23 hours a day against one's human rights. Now, if you don't know what solitary confinement, it's where they place them in a, in a cell, not too big, maybe five feet by five feet, and this is my guess, but I know it's very tight, no sensory at all. They aren't giving anything. They aren't even given natural daylight. They are stuck in one small cell for a day. And I can imagine what would be going on in your mind. This is considered torture. That's why United Nations has deemed it against your human rights to stay there for more than 22 to 23 hours a day. And so it shows that our body is equipped, is made, instinctually made to seek after relationships, seek after community. That's one aspect. Another aspect is that we are made to give and receive love. We are made to give and receive love. Satan's kingdom is all about taking, taking your possessions, taking your money, taking your, your loved ones, taking your, your safety, your protection. He wants to take, take, take so much so that you have nothing left to give and you feel empty, you feel destroyed, you feel hollow inside. But God's kingdom is much different. It's all about giving and receiving. Just like what I said, the triune, the triune head, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, it's love in perpetual motion. It keeps on moving. When God the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit loves God, so on and so forth. And it just creates a perpetual motion of love that never ends. And that is what's in us. We want to give and to receive of that love. God is love, and that's my prayer every time I do anything, that we realize that God is a God of love. And that's also innate in us. So that's the image we reflect. We are created in His image. In His image, we crave relationships, we want love, and we want to give it and receive it. But unfortunately, that's the good news. Now bring it to reality. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that the image is marred. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and we look at verse 6. And it reads, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Quick side note, can you hide from God? No way. So what's interesting is that sin makes you do illogical things. Adam and Eve knew they couldn't hide from God, and yet they hid. So sin stupefies the mind. It makes you do illogical things. Let's continue reading. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Then he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, 
What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is the sad news, the reality of where we are in Earth's history. Because of the original sin, the first sin that happened here on Earth, it caused a downward spiral of us and our image, the ideal image of God's love, God's relationship of giving and receiving, being marred and destroyed onward throughout centuries. In the story, we see that there is a man, there is a serpent, and Revelation tells us that serpent is none other than the devil, Satan himself. Eve believed in the lie, and in this moment, we start to see the downward spiral, spiral of the image being marred. So from Genesis 1 and 2 is the good news, is, is the very beginning of God's ideal. Chapter 3 and onwards, we start to see that image being broken down. For example, in those verses we just read, Adam and Eve start to blame each other. Their relationship used to be of giving and taking of love, of beauty, of relationship that was equal. But now they start to blame each other. Then we fast forward, the first murder happens with the kids, with their, her, their kids. Cain kills Abel. Now can you imagine, with me if you can, angels for the first time seeing sin play out, just trying to understand the severity of sin. And as they're watching, because we know that we're in a great controversy between good and evil, the angels, those who stayed with God, are still trying to understand if God truly is a God of love and if Satan's accusations are true. So they're watching, they're waiting, they're seeing how this is all being played out. And when sin comes along, they see their very first murder. And in their mind, their innocent, pure, undefiled, mind looks at it and sees the destruction, the pain that sin caused in this world. We continue on. We see that in Genesis chapter 6, it says that the hearts of men were evil continually. That it seems that God did not see his own image anymore, that the only loving thing, and, and hear me out, the only loving thing that he could have done in this moment was just to start all over and to cr make and to start a worldwide flood to cleanse the world of all this evil. And then I think about the story of, of Abraham. Abraham for the longest time was wanting a son and now he gets it. And then all of a sudden God says, you need to sacrifice your son. Now you have to understand in this context, he was around pagan worship of many pagan believers who believed in child sacrifice. And so he's, when he hears that command to go and sacrifice his child, his only son, he's probably thinking, wow, I guess this is the God that I serve. But as he was about to raise his knife and just and to kill his own son, the angel stops in midway and says, truly, now I know that you fear God. This is the backdrop of the world at the time. It was evil. Sin is marring the image of God. We're seeing murders, child sacrifices. That is grotesque. We see just people doing heinous crimes. When you see Lot go into um, Sodom and Gomorrah and as the angels were coming to save him and his family, though peop the people around them saw these angels and wanted to rape them. That to me shows the depravity of humanity and how sin truly destroys us from the inside out. And if we leave here, that's very depressing. 
we see today there is many things that we know that God's image is being marred from the sanctity of marriage to the idea that there is male and female now there are many other genders according to many people there are other problems that's happening around this world violence war mental issues there are so many things that's destroying our image and our belief of what that image is and it's very depressing but praise the lord god doesn't want us to be here and just to stay here and be depressed first and foremost he wants us to be saved by his grace that while we are sinners he died for us that's the beautiful gospel truth and number two he wants to restore us into his image he is in the business of restoration he is in the business of restoration so when you look at their sabbath school lesson the very first day i believe i think it's sunday it gives an illustration of a traditional goldsmith in india what a goldsmith would do is that it, to purify and to refine the gold he will get a mixture of salt tamarind fruit and brick dust and he would embed it in the bed it in the mix he would mix this and embed it in the gold rub it onto it and then we will place it into the fire and as the fire devours the mixture the gold becomes pure the goldsmith takes it out and if he notices that it's not pure enough he adds more mixture puts it into the fire and increases the heat even more now it says in the sabbath school lesson a person asks, how do you know when the gold is purified and this is what the goldsmith says he knows it's purified when he's able to see his face on the gold and that's such a beautiful illustration for us going through trials when we go through trials it's going to heat us up it's going to be hurting it's gonna it's gonna be hard but throughout the trials it refines us and purifies us and the more we go through these trials the more it helps us be purified and that our image will reflect the character of God so how will God restore his image in us turn with me to John chapter 15 John chapter 15 this is the parable of the true vine and we read in verse 1 I am the true vine and the father is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you cannot do nothing. You can, without me, you can do nothing. So according to this story, this helps us understand how God restores our image in us. First and foremost, we cannot do, we can't do anything of our own self to make us like him in his image. Nothing of ourselves can allow the working of our restoration and his image being refined and restored back. We can't do anything but what it tells us is that if we abide in him if we stay connected because Jesus is the source all we have to do is choose him as long as we continue to choose him day after day God will continue to refine us purify us and make us restored in his image so you might be asking, okay, we have to abide in Him. It's a choice. How long does this take? 
Will this take one day, two days, take a year or two? How long is this process of restoration? We're going to go through a few verses. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And it reads, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a, a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just like with the illustration, the more we get purified, the more we are tested and tried by fire, the more we start to see the image of God, the more we are able to mirror the goldsmith. So we're seeing here, verse 18, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image image we are mirroring his image from glory to glory from glory to glory now turn with me to romans so remember that we are changed and transformed from glory to glory from one glory to the other and from the other so on and so forth now turn with me to romans romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the righteousness of God, is a revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, so far we're hearing, we're building up the, my, 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 this point here. From glory to to glory from faith to faith and then uh, let's go back to second corinthians second second corinthians chapter four second corinthians chapter four and verse 16 therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day so from glory to glory, from faith to faith, day by day, our outward man is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. Our restoration goes day by day, from one faith to another faith. The more we read scripture, the more we are unveiling God's glory. And the more we continue to read it, it goes from glory to glory. The more we listen to sermons, the more we have our own devotional time, the more we pray, it changes our faith from faith to faith. What I'm trying to say is this, restoration does not happen immediately. We are not perfect just like that. We are not masters just like that. They say to be a master, you need to spend a considerable amount of hours. They've done studies that show that if you, if you spend time in one hobby or one specific thing for X amount of hours, you can be considered proficient to the point where you could also be called a master. But if you don't spend enough time, then you aren't proficient in it. And so it does not happen immediately. It's a process and it takes time. It takes time for us to be restored back to God's image. This is what Ellen White says in Faith I Live By, page 116. Sanctification is not the work of a moment. Now, sanctification means to be made holy, sanctify. So sanctification, the process of being sanctified. Sanctification, going back to the quote, is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, a day, but of a lifetime. It takes a whole life for you to be fully sanctified, to be restored into His image. 
continues on, it is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline, and stern conflict that we shall overcome. And so, let us not get bogged down. Let's not beat ourselves up trying to reach a certain ideal that we see others are, are at. We're all on our own journey. And as long as we have our devotional time and create that relationship with Christ and spend hours each and every day from faith to faith, from glory to glory, day by day, we will be sanctified and we will re be restored into His image. And that's good news. And so I remember this one illustration from uh, a preacher. He was telling us, There's a, imagine that you're in an idyllic mountain, you're in an idyllic lake, beautiful place, but it's a little dark and a little foggy. And then all of a sudden, you're on a canoe, and then you hear someone screaming for help. That's scenario one. Someone screaming for help, and you go into the paddle, and you find someone reaching out up in the air and saying, help me, save me. That's scenario one. Scenario number two, you're canoeing. You're paddling through the water. And all of a sudden, your canoe hits a hit something and it's a huge thump boom you almost fall out of your canoe and you find out it's a dead body now out of either scenario which one would you rather have scenario a or scenario b obviously you want scenario a because it shows that there is still hope and so for all of us today, we are like that one person drowning, but raising our hands, we are asking for help. And as long as we're asking for help, that means there's still life in us. So don't worry, continue seeking after Christ. He is the one on that, on that canoe. He will bring you out of that water. Just continue to bring your hand out and just say, Lord, save me like Peter asked when he was drowning in water, when he was commanded to walk towards Jesus. Though he may be of little faith, he knew the one who was able to save him. And so for all of us today who may feel bogged down because there's that perfectionist mindset that we need to be perfect, remember, it takes a while. It takes, it's a process. It takes time. As long as you seek after him and cry out to him and continue abiding in him you will be transformed and you will be changed so we're now going to go into the story of job i think the story of job is a great example of trial of someone being refined and re being purified and that through the whole process he gets to realize that god is a god of love what did he face well he lost his property he lost his family, he lost his children, he lost his livestock, which in that culture of that time, he lost his wealth. He lost every possession available to him. He even lost his health. He had boils all over him and he's scraping and putting ash on him and just in despair crying out to God, what is going on? And one of the biggest challenges is this that Job doesn't necessarily know why this is happening. We see the story of Job that in chapter 1 and 2, there seems to be a conversation in heaven between God, His heavenly angels, His heavenly counsel, and Satan. And he's, God says Himself, Have you seen my servant Job, who is blameless? Can you imagine? God looking down 
on earth and saying, have you seen Rodney? He's blameless. He is my child. He is my image. He, I, I am very proud of him for what he is doing in his, in his life. And that's what God is doing. Have you, seen my, have you seen my servant Job? He's blameless. But what does Satan say? What's his accusation? He says, he's only blameless because you have been blessing him. He has all the riches. He's, he's a good man because everything was given to him. He has a hedge around him. But get this. This is Satan's accusation. If I take it all away, he will surely curse you. It's like, okay, go ahead and do it. I know my servant, Job. I know that he is blameless. And Job, in the middle of his battle between God and Satan, the hope that we could have is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. It reads, No temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The good news is that if you're facing a trial today, if you're going through a situation, God will never give you something that you cannot handle. And if you're facing a trial like Job is, where you just don't seem to understand what's going on, He will make a way of escape. Isn't that good news? And so we continue. We look at Job's confession. Turn with me to Job. Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19 verse 25. And this is Job's confession of what he is honestly feel, feeling during this intense trial in his life. Job chapter 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know why there's so much tr he's facing so much heartache, so much pain. He doesn't know what has happened in the heavenly council of God and Satan and what's going on in his life. According to him, his world is just being destroyed. And through it all, just like, has God, just like what God predicted, blameless. This is my servant. He says, I know my Redeemer lives. Isn't that so beautiful? And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful to know that even though Job is actually considered to be one of the first books of the Bible, predates Moses, he didn't have scripture, but yet the stories are passed down from Adam and Eve to, who, to where he is. He knew the Redeemer. And in this moment, though he may not have scripture for him, he knew the story. He knew the testimony of his forefathers. And he knew that he had a Redeemer that lives. That despite all of this, he will see God. So through this refining process, what good has come for, J for Job? We now turn to Job chapter 23. We're going to read verse 1 to verse 10. Job answered and said, Even today, my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and, my, and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with me, him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he walk, works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. 
we clearly see when we look at verse 8, he says, look, I go forward, he is not there. I will go backward, cannot perceive him. When I go to the left, he cannot behold him. I cannot behold him. Right hand, I cannot see him. We see that in verse 8, He's looking for God, and things just don't make sense. We see a man who is honest with his feelings. Yes, he is blameless, but he's honest with what's going on. He literally does not know what is happening to him, but yet he continues to believe. Job was determined to endure, and what helped him persevere was that he will come out as gold. Not to be rich, not to have wealth, but when you look at verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. He knew that he was going to be refined through this process. Just like the illustration of the goldsmith in India, he continues to put in the fire. If it doesn't come out pure, he puts it back in and it heats up even more. And the goldsmith knows and he is only willing to do this and allow this to happen because through the trials, through the tribulations, it gives the opportunity for that gold to be pure and to be so shiny that it will reflect back to the goldsmith, our Father, our God. And so we see Job, he knew that this trial will not only make him better as a person, but it will strengthen his faith that through it all, he will turn out as gold. Isn't that beautiful? And the only reason why he's able to do this, look at verse 12. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessity of food. You see the priorities. He has no priority problems. He seeks after God more than food. And that's the only reason he was able to do this, because he continues to choose and abide with his, with his God. He continues to abide, because without God, you can't do anything. Hard as it is to understand the situation you may face, whatever trials you're going through, God can use these trials to refine and purify you and bring out His image in our character. James 1 verse 2 verse 8. We turn to James. James chapter 1 verse 2. It reads, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. Then you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. And so it's so beautiful found in James. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I've never heard someone who is driving to work, gets a flat tire, goes off to the side and says, praise God, I have a flat tire. No one goes on and says, when they, when they receive devastating news that maybe their family or themselves have cancer, they say, praise God. But it's such a different mindset. It, James tells us, count all joy when in all various trials, knowing that the testing of your, your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work then you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, what's amazing about trials is that when you're in trials, it starts to open up your eyes and take out the curtains and the, 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 the layers in your eyes for you to realize that truly there is a controversy going on in this world. And that when you yourself see it in your trials, 
you get to realize that God cares for you and loves you and will want you out of those trials because he makes a way of escape. I think back in my own personal stories, my own personal life, and what God has done through me. I went through a trial in my first year of being a pastor. I had no clue what I was doing. In fact, I actually didn't have, and I'm going to confess this, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't have a personal relationship with Him. I knew Scripture, but I didn't know Him. Until one day, one of my church members invited me to a debate between him and an atheist. And I thought, whoa, cool. I never been to a debate before. Let's try it out. So I watched some debates just to see how it would be. Usually they would have an argument, then a counter argument, then a counter argument, and then they'll be done. And that's how argument, formal arguments would be. And people would just watch and listen. But that was not the case. I went to this building and it wasn't a, a auditorium. It wasn't a stage. It was actually an art museum of a friend's. It was just an, a small gathering. I went upstairs and I found out it was just a conversation between my friend and his atheist friend. And the only person as the audience was me and my other church members, which were maybe three or four who were friends with the atheist. And I found out that this was not a formal debate, but this was just a conversation about who God is and how you can reconcile a God of love with suffering. And for three hours, I was sitting there stunned because I've never debated and wrestled with these ideas before. Never before was I tested and tried and asked about my own personal faith. I had nothing to say. For three hours, I was listening and watching and just hearing all these debates between my churchmen and my atheists. I never heard these before. I never defended my faith before. And towards the end, I remember this was a, a big rebuke on me. My church member said to me, well, we have a pastor. He didn't reveal my, reveal my identity, my occupation till the end. He said, well, we have a pastor. Good news. Pastor. What are your thoughts? And I just stood there stunned, paralyzed, because I had nothing to say. And from that moment on, I left that, that experience just think to myself, what am I doing as a pastor? I cannot even defend my faith. I can't even describe my relationship with Him. And that, turn, that brought forth a journey of me seeking scripture and looking into Adventist truth and understanding what we believe in, reading the great controversy, reading what, it, what happens in Daniel and Revelation, seeing the prophecies, and it made my eyes so open to what our message is all about, the three angels' message, and it made me even more convicted that as a pastor, it's sad to say that I learned of God when I became a pastor, but that was a moment that God gave me as a testing period to refine me. It hurt. It was very uncomfortable. The fire was heated up tremendously. But God is working in me, put all this mixture in me to make sure that I continue day by day faith to faith, glory to glory, to restore my image back to Him. So friends, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what trials, pain, tribulations you're going through. But remember, God loves you. And He's allowing these trials so that you could be refined and purified and to be able to see the image of Him in your life. So I want to close with this, a simple idea. It's called Eden to Eden motif. I might have shared this in our past studies. From Genesis chapter 1 to 2, we see the idyllic view, the ideal image of what God wanted for humanity and for creation. Chapters 1 to 2 is beautiful. God places Adam and Eve into the Garden of Eden, which Eden means pleasure. Now, 
Take away all your negative connotations of what pleasure is. It's been marred and destroyed. But we see here that God placed Adam and Eve to be in, a, in the Garden of Eden for pleasure, to enjoy life to its fullest. In Genesis chapter 3 comes the, dis, dis, um, the marring of, 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 of His image. And so from Genesis 3 and onwards, all the way up to Revelation, we see God in the business of restoring. From here on out to Revelation, we see God continuing to accommodate to us, continuing to show His love, continuing to restore us back to His ideal. And then when we look at Revelation 21 and 22, we see Satan is destroyed. We see this world is being barren. We're up in heaven. For a thousand years, we'll be spending time with God, for God, judging men and angels and seeing the books open and realizing that God is truly the God of love. Heaven comes down onto earth and sin, wickedness and all the evil people will be raised one last time and to see firsthand that He is a God of love and then will destroy them once and for all. Friends, what's amazing is that we are in the in-between, if you catch what I'm saying. We are in the process of, of, of restoration where in Revelation 21 and 22 shows us where God is going to take us. God is going to restore us back to His, his ideal. God is going to restore us back to what He originally intended. And so my humble appeal for you is continue to go faith to faith, glory to glory, day by day, because perfection doesn't come at a, twink, at, at a, at a quick moment, but a lifetime. And as long as you abide in Him, we will be able to be changed and renewed and purified in fire. And God will take us out of those trials and He will see the beautiful image of Himself in our lives. Isn't that so beautiful? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the study. Thank you, Father, that you are in the business of restoration. Be with us, Father. Help us to continue to put our heads up and know that we have a Savior that by grace we have been saved, that it is only by a gift. So Father, help us to choose you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.